welcome to the Plants as Liberation series. Uh, can you first share your name, your pronouns, and how you would describe your work today? Sure, peace. I'm Francis. I use she, they pronouns. And I would describe my work as land stewardship, community organizing, and remembrance. Awesome. I'm so excited to have you for this series, Francis. Thank you so much for sharing your time. Uh, can you first tell us a little bit about an early memory that you have with plants and what sparked your passion for land stewardship? Okay, my early memory that I want to share is actually from NYBG, which is Ooh. so funny to me. Yeah, I used to uh, work for the YMCA as a camp counselor um, many years ago, and we took the kids to, I think it's maybe the kitchen garden. I don't know the names of all the gardens, but it's it's where there were a lot of herbs, and I didn't you know, really grow up in, in growing spaces, um, but we went into the garden, and I was focused on the kids, but as soon as we walked in, someone had us like rub a basil leaf and smell, and it really changed the game for me. I was like, I remember texting my mom, like, we should get a farm. Mind you, we had never discussed anything about this. <laughs> and I smelled the basil. I saw the oregano, the thyme. I started thinking about pizza. I was like, this is crazy. I need to get down with this. And it really wasn't for many years. It wasn't until maybe like five, six, seven years after that, that I actually did get into it. But that was just such a weird moment to just like not be thinking about that, walk into that little garden that was for the kids, but still have such a really powerful, like, wow, I'm, I need to get back to this. I don't really know what this is, but it felt it felt important and it felt like a no brainer, despite being kind of foreign at the moment. And oh. then, yeah, and in terms of getting into this work, I it's kind of a whirlwind. I think for about two years, um, a lot of things were happening at once. So I was getting into herbal medicine. I had a skin condition um, and I had learned about, you know, working with herbs to make skincare products. And I, I thought I was just going to have to drink like a nasty tea. And I went to this uh, like a hippie to be herbal shop and, and they, you know, put me on to salves. And that was salves. That was really exciting. As that was happening, I was learning about police brutality. Uh, Mike Brown and, and um, Trayvon had just gotten murdered. And I was reading Octavia Butler. I was reading Asada Shakur's autobiography. I had seen a documentary on the Central Park Five um, and all of that I kind of was spiraling like, whoa, what is happening? I was becoming politicized. I was, you know, quote unquote, waking up and it all, you know, it all added up to, yes, herbal medicine, of course, um, healing ourselves with herbal medicine. And as I was reading and just learning about this country, learning about white supremacy, I felt like I had to go a little beyond and like fully connect to the land. I felt very concerned about um zombies I felt very concerned <laughs> about crisis I felt very concerned about you know things things hitting the fan and me not having skills to 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 support my family I I, I started feeling like damn how would I face my family if I couldn't even grow food as a black woman as as a Caribbean woman as someone who knows that you know we come from the land so I I wanted to essentially be a real human being and I got into um connecting to the land yeah and I wanted to also support others because I figured I couldn't be the only person who was feeling this way so mm. it was really, important, really important to me to to learn the information and you know remember is what I usually say remember the information to be able to support others in doing the same that's amazing oh my god you shared so many gems just now and <laughs> that well one that you felt your connection with plants early on at uh, the garden. It sounds like it was at the Edible Academy and I'm happy to say that they still have kids rubbing basil today. So that's really inspiring to hear that testimonial. Um, but then also just feeling a need to um, reconnect with these skills that we've always had in our ancestry as a way to take care of ourselves in a moment where it's like, oh, we might not getting, be getting care from other places. So how can I know how to take care of plants, know how to make things grow, know how to heal myself as a way to kind of find land stewardship. Mm -hmm. That's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And now you work at the farm school NYC, as well as um, you know, co-working with Woke Foods. So I know you don't do that by yourself. Um, can you talk a little bit more about those two uh, places for people who don't know um, and kind of the work that you do with them? Yeah, dope. Woke Foods is a really cool uh, woman-owned, Black woman-owned, uh, worker-owned cooperative. 
uh, focused on plant-based foods, focused on Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Dominican, Black plant-based foods. So we love woke foods. We do a lot of work around. So it's not just like plant-based with no connection to us, right? It's all about culturally relevant foods. It's all about reconnecting to our plant-based diets that we honestly already had prior to colonization, right? Uh, we do a lot of... Um, do a lot of catering work, we do a lot of workshops, do a lot of cooking demos. And our work is, yeah, it's rooted in, in culturally relevant uh, Black plant-based foods. And it's also connected to the land and living in right relationship with the land and really, you know, pushing ourselves to, to not live such extractive lives. So we have, so I do, um, I'm the food and land education coordinator. So yeah, a lot of workshops, a lot of looping in, you know, conversation, food justice, food sovereignty when talking about food. Um, and when supporting people and reconnecting to food. Um, and you mentioned co-working. Yeah, I'm a co-owner of Woke Food. So I work alongside Isanet, who I actually went to farm school NYC with. We, we met, we were part of the same cohort of farm school NYC. Um, and she brought me on to do the education component. Um, and it's been really dope. You know, she started it um, back in the day when she was looking to, to live a, a more healthy, more sustainable life, right? And, and better relationship with the earth. And she realized that as she was learning more about veganism, you know, plant-based diets, um, that she was like de feeling disconnected from her cultural food. So she was really inspired to eat her own kinds of foods, not just, you know, take on a foreign diet in the name of, of plants. It's, you know, it's deeper than that. And then Farm School NYC is uh, an urban agricultural program that is all throughout New York City with the Social Justice and Food Justice Foundation, right? So not growing food just to grow food, right? It's not just like some fun, it is fun, <laughs> but it's not just a fun um, hobby, right? A lot of us are in this program because we recognize, like you said, we can't depend on um, the systems that govern us to take care of us, to be honest. So I went through that program around that time, right? Where I was learning about police brutality, where I was learning about herbal medicine, wanting to really get the training to be able to to grow food um, and went through the program. It was great. And now I'm doing program program coordination. So I'm one of the two program coordinators and it's dope. I went through the program and now I get to support people from across the city who are now going through the program. Folks who are really excited to either begin their food and land journeys um, or, or strengthen strengthen the skills that they already have. It's, it's powerful work. Like I said, it's all over the city and it's cool because People have different goals and dreams and ideas. There, there are community organizers in the space. There are teachers. There are folks who are into policy. Um, we have a lot of folks coming in now who, um, you know, worked on community fridges and mutual aid projects throughout the pandemic. So a wide range of pe people who want to bring this work into the schools that there are people who want to start new schools, people who want to farm upstate, farm in the city, be a bridge between the two, people who want to be distributors. So it's a really powerful program um, in a place where people are like, what, you can farm here? So it's nice to, it's an affirming, affirming setup. And then, you know, farm school and woke foods often work together. Um, it's nice, it works out, it's convenient, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and so many amazing people have come out of the farm school. I mean, obviously you, um, I know Jalal from Sweet Freedom Farm is a farm school graduate. Tanya Fields from the Black Feminist Project is a farm school graduate. So. The fact they also both foods came out of the farm school, it's like really producing, in my eyes, like leaders in urban agriculture, not even urban culture, rural agriculture all over the place farming. So that's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. People go from this program and do such great, great work. And it's also a program, you know, a lot of people come in with trauma from, from school, from academia, whether that's students, you know, or faculty. So folks are in, you know, in the program not trying to replicate that, right? Like, how can we learn together? How do we honor the student as well as the facilitator? How do we incorporate everyone's learning styles? It's a really affirming and, and um, like accessible space, I would say. That's amazing. I love that you are now giving back and are part of the team too. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. And you're also teaching a class right now um, that's totally um, black led and black centered space cosmologies of the slave result. I'd love to hear more about that course and kind of what you feel comfortable sharing about why you wanted to have that offering. Yes, cosmologies of slave revolts. What a powerful course, co-facilitating that with the homie Kale, who I also met in farm school. <laughs> also in the same cohort. And we actually co-facilitated a course for farm school um, a couple times that 
centers on New York City and you know land history, basically understanding New York City outside of what we see right away, right outside of the cement, understanding who was here, whose stories are untold, who being people and plants, right? Understanding the ecosystem, like why there's a puddle here, why you know what water used to be here. I'm really supporting people and encouraging people to understand a space before they go and decide to do something there. How could you possibly just go somewhere and start a garden or start a growing space without knowing the history of the place, without knowing who, who was there, who's still there, who needs to be honored in the space, et cetera. So we used to co-facilitate that course together. Now we're doing this Cosmologies of Slave Revolts course and we're going deep, we're, we're studying liberation, we're studying what our black ancestors you know, went through on this land here, Turtle Island and beyond, but mainly we're focusing mainly on on Turtle Island and thinking about slave revolts and what needed to happen, right? The spirituality practices, the way we work together with plants for liberation and also supporting people in studying their family history. So Kale has done a lot of research and um, has accumulated a lot of tools to support people right outside of something like an ancestry.com, right? Which is like government document centered. So really supporting people in uplifting oral traditions, speaking to their families um, and really, trying to understand what our ancestors, like how our ancestors lived, right? Not just as vague, like they were enslaved and then they weren't and it kind of sucks still, right? Just like not that vague understanding, but more like what were their lives like and what can we learn from them for our own liberation? So speaking, you know, learning a lot about specific slave revolts here on this land, um, focusing on oral traditions, you know, we'll of course focus on Harriet Tubman soon and then supporting folks. It's actually split up so we meet on the full moons and the new moons. Now I'm getting into like how the program actually is, but basically <laughs> it's dope because there's a lot of us giving information and then a lot of us allowing space for folks to study their families, share resources with each other. Folks are like, oh, I'm from Virginia too. We need to talk. You know, there may be some research that we have to share with each other. So it's a really powerful space. And one of the main points of the course is that liberation cannot happen without us honing in on our spirituality. So it's really powerful stuff. Oh, that sounds so good. I didn't realize that there was kind of a piece to it, or I don't know if it was even intentional, but it kind of just happened about allowing people to tap into their own family histories too and legacies. Yeah, so that's yeah. pretty powerful. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the main, like people are coming in like, I, yeah, I'm, I'm here because I want to learn more about me, more about my family. Um, we actually had a session last night and folks got to share like, research they've done so far, roadblocks they face, successes that are that are working out for them, people they've spoken to, um, and everyone left the group with immediate, you know, next steps for, for these next couple of weeks. Folks were like, I'm calling this specific uncle, mm. out this specific website, you know, on genealogy, et cetera. So it's a really powerful space. That's amazing. I love that that is happening and that you're sharing that offering. I know just from knowing you, I've learned so much more about Harriet Tubman that I didn't know about how uh, she was an herbalist and more about her life using the plants too. So thank you so much for sharing this knowledge. It really is so valuable and needed. Yes, I love geeking out about Harriet with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also want to know if you could, as someone who has had experience, are you from New York? Sorry, Francis. I'm pretty oh, sure you are. Yeah, right? From the Bronx, yeah. From the Bronx. Um, and I would love to just hear kind of what are the challenges of like growing food in NYC? Like what do people have, if you want to just say, hey, I'm ready to start growing food tomorrow. Yeah. What are some of the things you have to do? What are some of the uh, challenges you have to face or even resources that are available to people who want to grow food in New York? Yeah, and every time I hear this question, I just see land, like the word land just like takes over my vision. Um, yeah, space, access to land and space. Um, there is land, there's always going to be land. It's just, you know, land is occupied. Um, there are a lot of buildings coming up, a lot of empty high rises, right? A lot of gentrification going on, folks being displaced. Um, folks being crammed into spaces despite there being these empty high rises that people are not moving into. So land is an issue for sure. Um, and people, you know, people find their way around that, whether that's growing on a rooftop. A lot of folks have done really creative things, honestly, in their windowsills and their, on their fire escapes. At the beginning of the pandemic for Woke Foods, we like very quickly put together um, a three-part Instagram live, like 
don't panic. Like <laughs> we understand you want to grow food. Like this is real. We don't really know what's going on with the pandemic. And we kind of just walk people through starting seeds and, and really thinking like, where do you have space? It's not, maybe you can't grow everything that you're going to eat, right? It's going to be very hard for us to completely detach ourselves from these oppressive systems, systems, but maybe there's a way to grow just the herbs that you consume. Maybe there's a way that for you to grow the herbs and someone else in your, build, in your building, you know, grows the tomatoes and someone else grows the onions and now you have a pasta sauce type of thing, right? So space is an issue. Um, honestly, a lot of people here in New York, this is the heart of the empire, right? So folks are overworked. Um, folks are overworked, folks are tired. Um, and it's a lot to juggle. It's a lot to, it's, it's not as simple as just joining a community garden, right? Like folks have a lot of responsibilities. Time is moving very quickly. Um, but those are some of the hurdles I would say for the most part, not everyone has a car, not everyone can go farm, you know, not everyone can go upstate and start a project. A lot of us are also competing with, with big corporations that are into like more food techie, um, adventures, things like, microgreens right we love microgreens um we love we love a lot of plants that are grown um in hydroponic and aquaponic but we're all not going to be able to afford um millions of dollars you know worth of millions of dollars worth of material to to run a factory to grow microgreens so we're competing with folks who have more money than us we're we're looking for land that we don't have and we're also very busy those are the challenges that come to mind that's so real yeah i mean as someone who has been living here five years and came from a space that had land and quickly moving to just a windowsill or fire escape. I was like, okay, this <laughs> is where it's going to happen. And yeah. now I feel really lucky to be a part of a community garden, but it was a wait list process to be on it. Mm -hmm. And it's not always accessible. You can't just go show up mm -hmm. and they don't just let you in. A lot of times there's a long wait list. You got to volunteer, pay your respects. You got to gain trust from the people who are part of the community garden to allow you to be a part of that space too. So right. yes, there is a lot of, there's a lot of challenges. It's not as easy as just, all right, I'm just gonna exactly. pop outside and plant a seed. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's true. Mm -hmm. uh, when thinking about liberation, I think about acts of freedom and escaping oppression. Uh, do you feel like plants liberate you? Uh, and if so, how? Yeah, totally. Plants definitely liberate me. I mean, yeah, when I realized as, as I was initially learning about herbal medicine, I was just like, damn, this is really how we used to, not used to, this is how we get down. We still get down this way. We were able to, to work with the plants and depend on plants. And again, in ways that we can't depend on, on our food system, on our you know current healthcare system. So when I'm thinking of plants as liberation, yeah, I'm thinking of medicine. I'm thinking of you know, people surviving births. I'm thinking of actual healing in the body and the mind, I'm thinking of cleaner air, I'm thinking of poison, right? I'm thinking of folks having to weaponize plants and successfully doing so. Um, yeah, I think it's it's really powerful. And not even that, not even just like I'm I'm consuming the plant. Sometimes people come in and they're like, that's cool. What's that for? What can I do with that? And it's like, damn, can you just like sit with the plant? <laughs> like, we don't you have to do the medicine right now. Can we sit with the plant? Even staring at a plant, right? Something else I learned. I took um I took the the intro to horticulture therapy course at NYBG and learned mm -hmm. a lot about just the power of staring at plants and just being around plants, right? So our, our growing spaces, our gardens, our farms as places of refuge, somewhere where you can just sit and be and, and not be harassed by a cop, right? Not be considered someone who's loitering. Um, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot that comes with just sitting with plants, sometimes consuming them for sure. And, um, and another thing that I've really been focusing on from the beginning, but more so now, I'm actually studying capitalism right now and just thinking about interdependentness, so just interdependence. So studying the way plants work together and, and live together and acknowledge one another and depend on one another, share resources. Like we, we it is in our best interest to not only consume plants, but to study them and, and, and work to go back to being more like them. And that's definitely one of the reasons why I love herbalism. I'm sure you have connected with herbalism too. Um, because it's just a way that you can just rely on yourself and take care of yourself. And I know that you specifically make fire cider. Mm -hmm. And I love that you focus very specifically on that herbal remedy as an offering, but also as a way to teach others how to make it themselves. So 
could you share for those who don't know what fire cider is and kind of why you that why that particular herbal remedy resonates with you so deeply? Yes. Wow. I'm like, why did this happen? You're right. I'm so deep in fire cider. <laughs> I can't remember how this started. Um, but yeah, fire cider is when you when you marinate, when you steep a bunch of different herbs and, and vegetables into um into a vinegar and you let that sit in there. I use apple cider vinegar. You let that sit in there so that can be garlic, herbs, onions. It's cool to see the different um, ingredients that pe people use. And also depending what you have, right? If all you have is onions and a little bit of cardamom or again, onions, oregano, thyme, cayenne, uh, ginger, things like that, letting that sit in there. And then after at least a month, I have some fire cider that's just been brewing for months i'm very nervous overwhelmed excited about that uh but yeah you let that sit for at least a month and then you strain out all that goodness all of the the garlic the onions the herbs and then you have this really powerful immune system boosting immune system supportive blend this this beverage this very spicy acidic beverage that you do have to be careful with um and it's fun i've you know i i in, in my experience, some folks will use it as a salad dressing base or will throw a splash into their soup. Um, I'll just drink it with some water. People will throw it into their, yeah, into their savory smoothies, things like that. And it's a very simple way. You know, we, we as humans have been working with vinegar and, you know, peppers, onions, all of these um, important, very, very old, very wise uh, plants for so long. So it's just like, so intense to see them all together working in this fluid and then knowing at minimum I can make this little concoction and, and take care of my body. And, and yeah, like I said, I, I sell fire cider and I'm very much like, please make your own fire cider. I'll make it for you, right? Like we can't make everything, um, but I, I do think it's cool that people just do it on their own and, and are sharing different recipes. And yeah, I got into it just immune system, man. Just wanna make sure we live in a very dirty, aggressive city um, and it's not our fault, it's cool. But yeah, just a simple, a simple way to take care of ourselves. And um, we can, I mean, I've gone through like each plant, like these are the different healing properties of, of each plant and just feeling really supported to know that with the fire cider, we can be not only strengthening our bodies, but, you know, cleaning our bodies, which is very important. So important. And I love that the, the moving away from gatekeeping of knowledge too, like it's important to, yes, I have this offering, but also you empowering people to share it themselves as well. I think there definitely needs to be more of that in herbalism. Mm -hmm. um, you've also, you've already talked about how to like barriers, I guess, to growing food in New York City, but I'm also wondering if you have any tips or advice for young folks who want to get into urban agriculture work. Maybe they're like, getting pushback from their family that, oh, you know, there's no money in that, or that's not a career. So that type of like, sometimes there's that rhetoric along with that. So do you have any tips for young people who are really interested in this type of thing, but might be hesitant to pursue it? Yeah, I know we just, just said that uh, joining community gardens are, is, you know, is not always easy. And I feel like that's a really important, really important entryway into growing food, seeing if there's something local, it's really important for us to stay local, y'all. Like, what can we do in our communities um, to support ourselves and each other? So really hoping that young folks will find community gardens, ideally walking distance. I know that's not always the case, but ideally something that's practical that you can access fairly easily and just be a student, be an observer. Um, I, when I first got into this work, I have not been in this work for, for too long, but yeah, I just wanted to learn. I wanted to be very helpful. Um, I did not helpful, not a savior, but definitely wanted to support work that was already happening. So I really hope young folks can see themselves as, as capable, important people in our communities and that they can join community gardens and, and just find very simple ways to, to loop into that. Or again, trying seeds. You know, we have the internet now. Folks are sharing resources across social media and maybe there are ways to at least start on the window. So I started uh, with the herbal medicine. I started with succulents, right? Succulents are fairly simple to grow, but starting simple. I think sometimes people get an idea and they're like, I need to do this all. I need to do it all right now. I need to become an expert by the end of the day. And that's really not the case. That's, there's nothing realistic about that. I hope young folks can just take it slow and, and come into the work humbly. Yeah. That's some wise sage advice for sure. <laughs> um if you were a plant what plant would you be and why oh god 
I don't know. Okay, I will be Rosemary. I love Rosemary Ooh. so much. She's like so sleek and serious. Um, she's just standing there all courageous and yeah, just supporting folks with with flow and you know, circulation, courage, remembrance. I would love to be like rooted in remembrance and and just like yeah holding all of our stories and, and supporting folks and tapping into those and also you know rosemary will just peace out for the winter like no i'm shutting this down <laughs> i'm gonna do me i'm gonna go to sleep i'm gonna rest i'm gonna regenerate and then come back strong in the spring which i think we i have for myself i need to learn from from rosemary about that so and then the smell i love rosemary so much i would be mm. uh, yeah as soon as you said it, i could smell it Exactly. And thinking about my aunt has this insane rosemary plant on her balcony. Every time I go and visit, I just like go to the balcony. I'm like, mm, yes, yes. Um, as I'm looking at the, all the books behind you, I'm wondering, like, what are you reading? What are you listening to? What are you watching uh, that's inspiring the work that you do? Yes. Okay. I'm reading a lot, you know, preparing for the for the course, for, this, uh, for the Cosmologies of Slave Revolt course. So, so peeking into a lot of old documents, um, a lot of a lot of research papers on how um, enslaved folks worked with plants. Last night we were talking about um, a project that the WPA um, put together, I think at the end of World War II, and they sent a bunch of white folks down south to interview formerly enslaved folks, which is an issue in itself, right? Because it's coming from white reporters, but it's really dope to read um, stories from people who were who were formerly enslaved. I just found that the Library of Congress has audio of people who were formerly enslaved. Wow. So that's really intense to listen to, to hear people's voices, hear people's stories, um, see research that people have done, going back to the research papers, seeing research that people have done um, on our relationships to plants. Um, I was thinking about the Hiatus Coyote, the most recent album that they put out. Um, there's a lot of music on there that sounds like it's like made for and by insects and plants. And a lot of their imagery is, is centered on insects and plants. It's nice to, to try to not just, you know, be in the lens of a violent, doofy human. It's really cool to hear their project and think about insects and, and things like that. Um, and yeah, just that's pretty much it. Yeah preparing a lot for, for that course um, and really, really just wanting to, to get a better understanding of how we used to live. I would say, yeah, how we used to be outside of capitalism, what we brought with us here, um, what we brought with us here. Of course, this was at the beginning of capitalism, right, when we were being forced over here, but still wanting to, to have a better understanding of how, how we were with each other. Mm, and I love so much of the stuff you're researching really humanizes enslaved yeah. people and like voices, like something like that. I have not heard um, audio accounts. So th that makes me now want to go and find that and listen to that for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any upcoming projects that you would like to share or elevate right now? I'm very happy to say that I don't. I'm focusing on farm school. I would say <laughs> So keep your eye. <laughs> I'm trying to simplify. Um, so no, no projects. You know the, the the course that I'm doing, the the cosmologies course is is going right now, right? It's closed off. It's not it's not open to the public at the moment. So that's happening. Farm school is happening all year round. We will have some public uh, public offerings soon for folks who are not in our um, citywide program. So hopefully there's some courses um, that'll excite people coming in a couple months. And that's pretty much it. There's nothing wrong with that. Also, just focusing on rest as well. <laughs> Where can people find you on the internet, Francis? Yes, you can find me. You can find me on Instagram. My page is at Freedom Franco Rants, R A N T S. Franco is F R A N S O. So at Freedom Franco Rants. Yeah, on Instagram. Great. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. It was so lovely to speak with you. Thank you, Ivy. Appreciate it. It's an honor.